Good day, everyone, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the second quarter 2024 Ducommon Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To participate, you will need to press star 11 on your telephone. You will then hear a message advising your hand is raised. To withdraw your question, simply press star 11 again. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. Now I will pass the call over to the common Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, Suman Mukherjee. Please go ahead. Thank you, and welcome to DuCommons 2024 Second Quarter Conference Call. With me today is Steve Oswald, Chairman, President, and CEO. I'm going to discuss certain limitations to any forward-looking statements regarding future events, projections, or performance that we may make during the prepared remarks or the Q&A session that follows. Certain statements today that are not historical facts, including any statements as to future market conditions, results of operations, and financial projections are forward-looking statements under the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995 and are therefore prospective. These forward-looking statements are subject to risks, uncertainties, and other factors which could cause actual results to differ materially from the future results expressed or implied by such forward-looking statements. Although we believe that the expectations reflected in our forward-looking statements are reasonable, we can give no assurance that such expectations will prove to have been correct. In addition, estimates of future operating results are based on the company's current business, which is subject to change. Particular risks facing due common include, amongst others, the cyclicality of our end-use markets, the level of U.S. government defense spending, our customers may experience delays in the launch and certification of new products, timings of, timing of orders from our customers, legal and regulatory risks, the cost of expansion and acquisitions, competition, economic and geopolitical developments, including supply chain issues and rising or high interest rates, the ability to attract and retain key personnel and avoid labor disruptions, the ability to adequately protect and enforce intellectual property rights, pandemics, disasters, natural or otherwise, and risk of cybersecurity attacks. Please refer to our annual report on Form 10-K, quarterly reports on Form 10-Q, and other reports filed from time to time with the SEC, as well as the press release issued today, for a detailed discussion of the risks. Our forward-looking statements are subject to those risks. Statements made during this call are only as of the time made, and we do not intend to update any statements made in this presentation, except if and as required by regulatory authorities. This call also includes non-GAAP financial measures. Please refer to our filings with the SEC for a reconciliation of the GAAP to non-GAAP measures referenced on this call. We filed our Q2 2024 quarterly report on Form 10-Q with the SEC today. I would now like to turn the call over to Steve Oswald for a review of the operating results. Steve. Okay, uh, thank you, Saman. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today for our second quarter conference call. Uh, today, and as usual, I'll give an update on the current situation at the company, after which Saman review our financials in detail. Uh, let me first uh, start off this quarterly call with Ducommons Vision 2027 Game Plan for Investors. Strategy and vision were developed coming out of the COVID pandemic over the summer and fall of 2022, unanimously approved by the Common Board in November 2022, and then presented to investors the following month in New York, where we got excellent feedback. Since that time, the Commons Management has been executing the Vision 2027 strategy by consolidating its facility or rooftop footprint, increasing the revenue percentage of engineered product and aftermarket content, continuing its targeted acquisition program, executing our offloading strategy with defense primes and high growth segments of the defense budget, and by expanding content on key commercial aer aerospace platforms. All of us here have a high level of conviction in the Vision 2027 strategy and financial goals and believe the many catalysts ahead present a unique value creation opportunity for shareholders. The Q2 2024 results were also a very good example of our strategy working. Q2 was a record revenue and gross margin quarter, 
follows up the strong start we experienced in the first quarter. Revenues were $197 million, going 5.2% over the prior year. This is our fourth consecutive quarter with revenues exceeding $190 million. Strong growth in our commercial aircraft business across Boeing, Airbus, and business jet helped drive revenue during the quarter. We saw significant growth on the A220 program, where we make the skins for the entire fuselage, along with good growth in twin aisle platforms as well. Business jet revenues were higher driven by work we do for Gulfstream. We also saw an increase in our commercial revenue as we build buffer stock to support the Monrovia facility closure and transfer to DCO's Guamas, Mexico operation. Q2 was also supported by us building a higher production rate than SPR and VA to allow for efficiencies, workforce retention, and level loading of our production. Overall, commercial aerospace was up 13% from Q2 2023 we have now grown year-over-year -year revenue in our commercial aerospace business for 12 consecutive quarters, demonstrating the resilience of our business even in a challenging OEM environment with SPR and DA. The other good news for DCO's commercial aerospace business is the Fuselage Skin Project for the 737 MAX at Spirit, which we have been working on. We now anticipate having the FAI approved in September and shipping the first production set in October. 2025 revenue for the four skins should be over $3.5 million at 15 ship sets a month. Keep in mind this is less than 10% of the fuselage, so stay tuned for more news as we move forward and gain more program share. Our defense business grew 3% year over year with strong demand for the F-15, Blackhawk, and radar platform as well as selective naval submarine programs. Growth was partially offset by declines in programs such as the JSF, F-18, which we have discussed in the past, and the F-16. A pause in the tow missile production contributed as well, but we now have a new PO from RTX and anticipate starting shipments again in July 2025 from Guaymas, Mexico. Defense business of $100 million in revenue for the third time in the last four quarters. And we remain optimistic about the growth ahead. On offloading for our, from RTX, our SPY-6 radar circuit card business grew over 100% from Q3 last year, tracking now for over $10 million in revenue in 2024 for just one CCA. We have the next card for the SPY-6 program in process and that will be in production next year. Another record highlight in Q2 was gross margin of 26% for the quarter, up 460 BIPs year over year from 21.4% and 140 BIPs compared to the first quarter as we continue to realize benefits from our strategic value pricing initiatives, productivity improvements, favorable product mix, growing engineered product portfolio with aftermarket, and initial restructuring savings. In addition, our Berryville, Arkansas facility is now down to less than 10 people to maintain, to maintain, capability, uh, maintain capability on a single platform until, receiving, until the receiving plan is certified. Our Monrovia, California facility also significantly reduced headcount this month, with most production activities shut down, and the team is down to less than 20 employees. The Monrovia plant will be fully closed by the end of September. We will see the cost savings of these moves as the receiving plants ramp up production in 2025. So stay tuned. For adjusted operating income margin in Q2, the team delivered 10.1%, a record performance, and well ahead of the 8.1% number in Q2 2023. This is a great result driven again by the continued growth in our engineered product businesses, favorable product mix, impact of our strategic pricing initiatives, and our restructuring savings begin beginning to kick in during the quarter. Adjusted EBITDA was another great story in Q2, hitting $30 million for the first time. A big deal, while expanding a robust 130 basis points to 15.2% of revenue compared to 13.9% in Q2 2023. This all provides momentum 
along with the Q1 results as we work towards the 18% goal in our Vision 2027 plan. The gap diluted EPS was 52 cents a share in Q2 2024 versus 17 cents a share for Q2 2023. And with adjustments, diluted EPS was an impressive 83 cents a share compared to diluted EPS of 54 cents in the prior year quarter. The higher gap and adjusted diluted EPS was driven by improved operating income as well as lower interest costs due to our hedging strategy during the fourth. The company's consolidated backlog increased both sequentially and compared to the prior year quarter. Total company backlog ended Q2 at a new record of $1 billion, million, increasing over $22 million sequentially and almost $58 million year over year. Defense backlog increased $98 million compared to the prior year quarter to, the, to, the end of, to end at a record of $592 million. The commercial aerospace backlog decreased $14 million year over year, primarily due to industry issues with single aisle production rates and the max issues with Boeing and Spirit. However, our commercial aerospace backlog still grew on a sequential quarterly basis to $451 million. As for the 2024 revenue guidance, and despite continued uncertainty surrounding Boeing, Spirit, and the FAA on the max, we are maintaining our guide of mid-single digits for the year, with Q3 flattish to last year, followed by an uptick again in Q4. While we have seen a significant slowdown in the max build rates at the OEM level in Q2, and anticipate the same in Q3, we are positioned for the recovery as the build rates ramp back up. If BA is at 38 by year end for their most recent communications on the max, this will be a major lift for DCO. I will also add that despite the challenges in the max, we are comforted by continued strength on other programs at BA and Spirit, Airbus, and Gulfstream. Now let me provide some color on our markets products and programs. Beginning with our military and space sector, we experienced revenues at 101 million compared to 97 million in Q2 2023. Growth was driven by the F-15 program along with military rotary aircraft, notably the Black Hawk program, as well as our radar franchise, again, driven by the SPY-6 program. These were partially offset by weakness in F-35, F-18, and F-16 revenues. The second quarter military and space revenue represented 51% of the commons revenue in the period, down from 59% back in 2022 and 70% in 2021. We expect these trends, we expected these trends and reflect more and it reflects more balance with commercial aerospace, which we like. We also ended the second quarter with a backlog of 592 million, an increase of 98 million year over year, representing 55% of the commons total backlog. Within our commercial aerospace operations, second quarter revenue continued to see double-digit growth, increasing 13% year-over-year to $87 million, driven mainly by growth on the A220 platform, twin-aisle aircraft, business jets, as well as buffer builds support the closure of a Monrovia facility. As mentioned earlier, we believe a much better story is ahead for BA and MAX by the end of Q4 and in 2025. The backlog within our commercial aerospace business was $451 million at the end of the second quarter, increasing almost nine million sequentially and a solid number given the temporary weakness in the commercial aerospace market. Now with that, I'll have Suman review our financial results in detail. Suman. Thank you, Steve. As a reminder, please see the company's Q2, 10Q, and Q2 earnings release for a further description of information mentioned on today's call. As Steve discussed, our second quarter results reflected another period of strong performance with growth in both our commercial aerospace and military end markets, as well as continued improvement in our margins. We remain encouraged by the continued strength in domestic and global travel, which would support higher long-term demand for aircraft as we work through some of the industry issues impacting single aisle production rates. In addition, we also made good progress on our facility consolidation efforts during the quarter which will drive savings in 2025 and beyond. With all this, we feel like 2024 is showing good momentum that will continue to drive our performance towards our Vision 2027 goals. Now turning to our second quarter results. Revenue for the second quarter of 2024 was 197 million, 
versus 187.3 million for the second quarter of 2023. The year-over-year -year increase of 5.2% reflects growth in both commercial aerospace and military in space, highlighted by 9.9 .9 million of growth across our commercial aerospace platforms and 3.2 million of growth in our military and space platforms. We posted total gross profit of 51.2 million or 26% of revenue for the quarter versus 40.1 million or 21.4% of revenue in the prior year period. We continue to provide adjusted gross margins as we have certain non-GAAP cost of sales items in the current and prior period relating to inventory step-up amortization on our recent acquisitions, restructuring charges, and the impact from the Guaymas fire on our operations. On an adjusted basis, our gross margins were 26.6% in Q2 2024 versus 23.1% in Q2 2023. The improvement in gross margin was driven by our growing engineered products portfolio, as well as favorable product mix in our manufacturing services businesses, strategic pricing initiatives, productivity improvements, and some initial restructuring savings. We continue to make progress working through a difficult operating environment with supply chain and labor. Through our proactive efforts, including strategic buys and our inventory investments, we have been able to avoid any significant impact thus far on our business. During the second quarter of 2024, we reduced our inventory by 7.1 million from Q1, while still keeping our performance centers positioned to meet our 2024 delivery commitments and ready for a ramp up in commercial aerospace build rate. We grew our contract assets by 13 million versus Q1. This was partly due to buffer build of product to support the Monrovia facility closure, as well as some modest build ahead in our commercial aerospace structures business to level load production. We continue to look for opportunities to unwind our working capital investments to improve our cash flow. Ducommon reported operating income for the second quarter of 13.9 million or 7.1% of revenue compared to 5 million or 2.7% of revenue in the prior year period. Adjusted operating income was 19.9 million or 10.1% of revenue this quarter compared to 15.2 million or 8.1% of revenue in the comparable period last year. The company reported net income for the second quarter of 2024 of 7.7 .7 million or 52 cents per diluted share compared to net income of 2.4 million or 17 cents per diluted share a year ago. On an adjusted basis, the company's reported net income of 12.5 million or 83 cents per diluted share compared to net income of 7.3 million or 54 cents in Q2 2023. The higher net income and adjusted net income during the quarter were driven by higher operating income and adjusted operating income. Additionally, our interest rate hedge helped reduce our year-over-year -year interest expense. Now let me turn to our segment results. Our structural systems segment posted revenue of 95.6 million in the second quarter of 2024 versus 80.2 million last year. The year-over-year -year increase reflected 10.4 million of higher sales across our commercial aerospace applications, including the A220 and select twin aisle platforms, in addition to regional business jets and buffer build to support the Monrovia facility closure. In addition, we maintained commercial aerospace build rates for selected products to help level load production and maintain production efficiencies. The 5 million of higher revenue within the military and space markets was driven by strength in Black Hawk and other military programs. Structural systems operating income for the quarter was 10.6 million or 11% of revenue compared to 5.4 million or 6.7% of revenue for the prior year quarter. Excluding restructuring charges and other adjustments in both years, the segment operating margin was 15.4% in Q2 2024 versus 16% in Q2 2023. The slight decline was from higher costs due to the transition of production from Monrovia to Guaymas, partially offset by strategic pricing initiatives and operating leverage from higher revenues at other performance centers within the segment. Our electronic systems segment posted revenue of 101.4 million in the second quarter of 2024 versus 107.1 million in the prior year period. The decline is attributable to lower revenues from in-flight entertainment electronics, F-18 and F-35 platforms, along with a reduction in our industrial business as we chose to selectively prune non-core business. The declines were partially offset 
offset by strength on select military platforms, including the F-15, Spy-6 radar, and naval and submarine programs, along with business jets with Gulfstream and on the A-220 platform with Airbus. Electronic systems operating income for the second quarter was 16.8 million, or 16.6% of revenue, versus 9.5 million, or 8.9% of revenue in the prior year period. Excluding restructuring charges and other adjustments in both years, the segment operating margin was 16.9% in Q2 2024 versus 11.4% in Q2 2023. The year-over-year increase was primarily due to shifting mix with higher growth in revenues and profitability in our engineered product businesses, along with strategic value pricing initiatives, as well as savings from the restructuring program. The restructuring savings were driven by the transition of product lines from our variable performance center to other facilities. Next, I would like to provide an update on our ongoing restructuring program. As a reminder, and as discussed previously, we commenced a restructuring initiative back in 2022. These actions are being taken to better position the company for stronger performance in the short and long term. This includes the shutdown of our facilities in Monrovia, California, and Berryville, Arkansas, and the transfer of that work to our low-cost operation in Guaymas, Mexico, and to other existing performance centers in the United States. We continue to make progress on these transitions with excellent employee retention and engagement, and are also working diligently with our customers, Boeing and RTX, to obtain the requisite approvals. During Q2 2024, we recorded 2.1 million in restructuring charges. The majority of these charges were severance and related benefits as we continue to wind down the two operations. We expect to incur an additional three to four million in restructuring expenses through the end of 2024 and early 2025 as we complete the program. Upon the completion of our restructuring program, we expect to generate 11 to 13 million in annual savings from our actions and are already beginning to see some realization of savings from these actions this year. We anticipate selling the land and building at both Monrovia, California, and Berryville, Arkansas. Turning next to liquidity and capital resources. Year-to-date, Q2 2024, we generated $1.8 million in cash flow from operating activities, which was an improvement compared to year-to-date Q2 2023, which had a usage of $9.7 million. The improvement was due to higher net income of $7 million, as well as improvements compared to prior year in accrued and other liabilities. As of the end of the second quarter, we had available liquidity of $205.4 million, comprising of the unutilized portion of our revolver and cash on hand. Our existing credit facility was put in place in July 2022 at an opportune time in the credit market, allowing us to reduce our spread, increase the size of our revolver, and allowing us the flexibility to execute on our acquisition strategy. Interest expense was $4 million compared to $5.7 million in Q2 of 2023. The year-over-year -year improvement in interest cost, despite a higher debt balance, was due to the interest rate hedge going into effect. In November 2021, we put in place an interest rate hedge that went into effect for a seven-year period starting January 2024, and pegs the one-month term so far at 170 basis points for $150 million of our debt. The hedge resulted in interest savings of $1.4 million in Q2 2024 and will continue to drive significant interest cost savings in 2024 and beyond. To conclude the financial review for Q2 2024, I would like to say that the second quarter results continued our momentum from Q1 and positions us well for the rest of 2024. I'll now turn it back over to Steve for his uh, closing remarks. Steve. Okay, yeah, thanks, Simon. And uh, just in closing, you know, Q2 was, a, uh, was an excellent quarter and a record in, in some cases with many highlights for the company and our shareholders. As we start to realize uh, some of the gains we all expect for the uh, Vision 2027, especially around margin expansion. Our first, our first half position as well to deliver a strong performance in 2022 despite uh, some of the current constraints. Uh, the progress on gross and even a margin expansion has been excellent. We're not surprised and feel right on schedule. In addition, on two key tenets of our 2027 game plan, we're tracking well against the goals of 18% even margins 
and 25% or more of engineered product and aftermarket revenues. With commercial aerospace build ramps still ahead of us and the benefits from our facility consolidation expected to kick in starting in 2025, I'm excited about what lies ahead for us at the Common and our shareholders in the years ahead. Stay tuned. Okay, with that, uh, let's please uh, go to questions. Thank you. One moment for our first question. And it comes from the line of Jason Gersky with City. Please proceed. Yeah, hello there, uh, everybody. Thanks for taking the question. Jay. Hey, um, Steve, maybe we start with you and talk a little bit about um, the pipeline of new opportunities and maybe just kind of give us a, a flavor of how things have evolved uh, year to date, you know, starting at the beginning of the year, where you are today and, and what you see in the pipeline. I'm just curious if um, anything kind of new and interesting um, has popped up for you uh, here over the last uh, six, seven months. And, um, you know, when you, uh, you know, look out over the next couple of years, what you think the uh, pipeline conversion might look like and book to build uh, just kind of the general demand flavor um, as well. Thanks. Sure. Okay, thank you. Good good to be with you. So first, let me just tackle the commercial aerospace. There's, you know, I uh, talked about the uh, the skins, and uh, that's, uh, you know, though not a huge number starting next year, about three or four million. I mean, we're only doing less than 10% of the fuselage uh, for the MAX. Uh, you know, we do 100% of the fuselage for the A220, so we, we can do it, right? We have the capacity, we have the machine. So, uh, that's something in the pipeline, you know, we're very, very excited about. We're also, uh, and just can't disclose it today, we're also working uh, on opportunities uh, more on the commercial aerospace side and specifically around uh, share shift from some of our competitors and won't get into it today, but we have uh, some nice things happening there. We're going to pick up, uh, and I can, you know, disclose this, we're going to pick up also on the 787 a good amount of business starting in January 2025. Uh, and the uh, 787, you know, gets to five or ten. That's 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 real money for DCO. So on that side, it's good. We just met with Airbus at the air show. Uh, you know, we're in a very good position. You know, with Airbus, uh, you know, they're they're going on the way up, and we're going to go on the way up with them. So I think on the commercial side, it's all looking very positive, and there's, there'll be more news coming. On the defense side, uh, you know, we. Certainly work on sort of the hypersonic and the other, uh, you know, uh, sort of things that uh, we probably can't discuss the, on the call too much. But uh, I'll just give you one example. This offloading program has been great for us. We're really getting heavy into radar. Uh, you know, we we make one card so far on the SPY-6, and year to date it's been over $5 million for one card. So uh, we're going to bring on another card next year. So we, we've got some very nice things happening in defense not only organically, but obviously, you know, with share shift as well. Uh, and we just met with Raytheon uh, at the air show and had a great meeting. And the Tomahawks are uh, going to go to Guaymas, which is going to be a great uh, boost for us uh, from where we are now in Berryville. That's a major program. We've had that since the 80s. Uh, it's right now, obviously, we built all the buffer to, to move it. So, uh, But we have uh, some wonderful margin expansion happening there as well as we go to, uh, to Guaymas and the tow. So the toe is also coming back. We talked about that already in my remarks, uh, coming back mid-year. We have already have the PO for that in Guaymas. So uh, both on the commercial and defense side, uh, looking good to very good. And then also, you know, obviously, uh, if the build rates, which I think are going to go up uh, eventually, that's going to be uh, some nice tailwind as well. Okay, great. And then just a quick follow-up. Uh, Saman, you mentioned um, maybe some additional – uh, liquidity or capacity, um, and I think you mentioned M and A in the same sentence. So I'm just kind of curious to get an update, um, you know, just on uh, the pipeline of potential M and A, and have you, you know, further opened the aperture on on potentially doing something uh, larger, where we'd be bringing in more revenue than what you had targeted for Vision 2027. So we continue to look at a number of opportunities. Um, I would say that. Uh, in terms of us being able to meet and exceed the target we set uh, forth in Vision 2027, 
which is a $75 million placeholder for revenue from acquisitions, we feel very good about being able to meet and exceed that. So uh, I, I would agree. Are we looking to do something bigger than uh, or something more transformational at this time? No, we're looking to continue our strategy of uh, doing the stuck in acquisitions of niche product lines uh, in kind of a more manageable size range and be prudent with our uh, leverage uh, at this time. So uh, we aren't looking to ch change the aperture on, on size of deals, but we feel good about being able to exceed the Vision 2027 uh, target for acquisition revenue. Okay, great. I'll pass the line. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Our next question comes on the line of Mike Crawford with B. Riley Securities. Um, thank you. So, Simon, you, you benefited from absorption as you built some buffered stock now. Can you just walk us through how um, margins are affected by the ramp up at, at Guaymas and as you work through this, um, this buffer that you've built up and get into a more normalized cadence? Right, so uh, great question, uh, Mike. And uh, we did have a significant improvement in our uh, structures, segment margins on a sequential quarter basis. And to the point you just made, it was driven to a large extent by Monrovia having better absorption. So actually, it's, you know, Monrovia had significantly lower revenues in Q1 uh, versus the Q4 of last year and, and, and Q1 of last uh, of, of 2023. So we saw a very low revenue base kind of trying to handle a higher fixed cost base in Q1, which led to a higher one-time costs related to the transition in Monrovia in Q1. We had lower costs. We had doubled the revenue in Monrovia as we built up buffer stock and looked to close out operations. We had doubled the revenue in Q2 versus Q1 in that Monrovia facility. That helped with, you know, with absorption, again, to the point you made, right? And we also had some slightly better mix. So we feel like the improvement that we're seeing in, in that structure segment margin in Q2, which is in line with where structure's margins have been historically, is is sustainable, if, if that's kind of where you were getting to. Oh, okay, thank you. And just, um, <clears throat> excuse me, related, you're getting near the end of this, I guess, second restructuring program since um, you guys joined the company and put it on its current trajectory. But uh, I know you, you, there's 11 to 13 million cost savings target, but I imagine a chunk of that has already been realized. That is correct. So I would say that from our uh, Berryville and Joplin uh, facility, we are right now tracking at a run rate of, I would say, two to three million of, of savings uh, annually. So an annual run rate of two to three million, I would say, is where we are right now uh, from the shutdown of Berryville. Of course, that will ramp up later in 2025 when we actually start production of some of those product lines in Guaymas, Mexico. So that hasn't started yet. Yeah, I wouldn't say a good shot, Mike. I would say it's I think two to three is fair. Right. Okay. There's a lot more coming. Right. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. And as a reminder, if you do have a question, simply press star one one. Our next question is from Michael Sharmoli with Truist Securities. Hey, uh, good afternoon, guys. Thanks for taking the questions. Um, Hi, good Mike. results. Hey, uh, yeah, Steve or Suman, the, the buffer stock, um, I think coupling that with maybe, I think you said you're building ahead right now. How, how should we sort of calibrate ourselves just on the revenue? I, I think you, you said 3Q would be down a little bit, but but do we have to go through a, an unwind period here or as, as we look out over the second half of the year, even into early 25, just depend. I mean, you know, I don't think we have a crystal ball with, with Boeing's rates or Airbus's for sure, but how, how should we think about maybe the, the impact of the build ahead and buffer on revenues? Yeah, hi, Mike. Uh, great question. So we, during Q2, uh, we had about, I would say, uh, between the buffer build and the build ahead, 
uh, somewhere between five to six million in, in revenue that you could say was pulled ahead from Q3 and Q4. Uh, and so that's kind of how I would think about how Q3 comes out in line with what Steve uh, said a little earlier, uh, Q3 being flattish on a year-over-year -year basis. Uh, and then seeing improvement in Q4, so that kind of all in all, we come out at that mid-single-digit guidance for the full year. Yeah, yeah. Mike, I think that's, that's the right way to think about it. I think overall it's light. The impact is light. Okay. Um, so it's not anything I'm very concerned about. But, you know, just for everyone on the call, I mean, you know, uh, we're a little, you know, Parsons is a big uh, uh, manufacturer for both Spirit and for BA, and, uh, you know, we just don't want to have to lay off 40 people and then four months later hire them again. That's right, right, yeah, of course. So there's a little, there's, a, so there's some retention, employee retention in there that I think uh, investors, I think, hopefully will agree it's smart. Got it. Um, and then just on the, the aerospace, I mean, I know, you know, we, we can kind of see it in our models. You, you've got the slide out there, highest quarterly revenue rate since, um, you know, 3Q19. Is there any way to measure that on a same store sales basis? I mean, you've obviously had some acquisitions in there. You've, you've picked up some new programs like the A220, but just knowing that Max had been one of the biggest programs, you know, uh, just trying to get a sense as to if I were looking at that on same store sales versus that that 3Q, you know, how much runway do you still have? Because I mean, we were still well below prior peak production rates here. Yeah, I, th I think we have a lot. I think uh, when you when you go back that long, I mean, if you think about us now, it's a lot more defense business than we had back then. So uh, that's one thing to think about, and also, uh, and uh, which is extremely important, we have uh, uh, a good deal more engineered product in aftermarket. So uh, you know, and that could also fall into commercial, right, Mike? But yeah, you know, okay. We're much more. Uh, we were we were certainly different back then. And uh, so you're right that, you know, we have, the, I think, the right kind of base. I think we have good balance. And I think that, you know, we're, we're very anxious. I know it's Kelly's first day, so we're, we're going to cheer for him. And, uh, you know, we certainly feel like things are going to get better. We're going to ride the ramp up. And I think that's going to be great for our revenue. Got it. More Got it. I'll add there, Mike, to, as, you help, as, you, as you think about modeling uh, our commercial aerospace revenues relative to where we were in 2019, a little over half of our revenues come from, of our commercial aerospace revenues come specifically from Boeing and Airbus platforms. So, uh, you know, you, you couldn't apply build rates directly to our entire commercial aerospace revenues. There are other elements, including business jets, commercial helicopters, uh, and other in-flight entertainment stuff and things that we do. So if you were looking really at build rates across Boeing and Airbus platforms, uh, a little more than half is from, yeah. Way low. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Of course, that um, will grow higher as, as yeah, yeah. That, that will grow yeah. higher, but right now it's that much. Okay. And it's just the last one. Any, any thoughts, Suman, on, on free cash generation? I know you, you kind of mentioned that inventory being down sequentially, but, you know, just, yeah, I, I know you've got the, the guidance out there on the top line. Talked a little bit about the margins and where we should be, but how, how should we think about cash generation second half of the year here and, and into 25? Yeah, that's an important focus area for us, uh, Mike, at the company. And uh, Q2, as, as you noted, was impacted by uh, build-up in contract assets as we um, did some of these buffer builds. We did some amount of uh, build-ahead on commercial aerospace platforms. Uh, we do expect uh, that Q4 will be really strong for us in terms of cash flow to end out the year uh, on a much more positive note, and, and that is uh, a priority for us. I mean, I would expect Q3 to be marginally better, but not significantly, but with a real ramp up in cash flow towards the end of the year. Okay. That's Perfect. 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 That pattern as well in, in our business. Okay. Okay, good. Thanks, guys. I'll jump back in the queue. Okay. Mike, thanks. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Noah Poponak with Goldman Sachs. Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Noah. Juman, maybe just picking up there, how should we think about where free cash to net income conversion or EBITDA conversion 
go, you know, over the medium term, if you kind of think about more normal times where you're not having to build ahead and um, you don't have so much uncertainty at, at the customers and, um, you know, things are kind of coming along a little bit more visibly. Yeah, no, uh, excellent question. Thanks, uh, Noah. Uh, you know, in the in the longer run, we do want to get our free cash flow closer to the net income number. Uh, we're not going to get there here in the next few quarters or next year as we, we continue to have significant amount of inventory and, and contract assets on the balance sheet and supply chain pressures, while they have eased, are still significant. Uh, we continue to have close to two years of lead time on inventory. We have fluctuations in build rates, which often means we are stuck with raw material inventory we have ordered two years in advance sitting on our balance sheet. So uh, as, as those supply chain pressures ease, there is more predictability in production rates. We will be able to continue to wind down our strategic inventory uh, that we have been holding for the past few years, and it will get us over the next uh, couple of years, uh, in you know, closer to that target of getting our free cash flow in line with our net income. Yeah, yeah. And no, this is Steve. I also think that some of this restructuring is going to help. I mean, there's other things that bigger, bigger rocks for the market and troubled companies and you know, strategic buying and everything. But it also is going to help us on the manufacturing services side to have a shorter, a smaller footprint and I think better management over our inventory and our processes. Okay, that's helpful, appreciate that. Um, on the margins, the segment margins, I guess, would it be possible to just speak to how you expect each segment's margin in the second half to kind of directionally compare to the first half? Just, you know, Electronic Systems has had this, this pretty sizable increase year over year um, structural, you talked about the difference between 1Q and 2Q, but that's a pretty big difference. How do each of those shape up second half versus first half? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take that. So uh, we don't, while we don't give guidance at the segment level for margins, I can, can give you some comments which are you know, directionally help you. So if you look at the our electronics margins, they have uh, jumped uh, uh, in Q1 of this year, and they've kind of stayed in the ballpark here in, in Q2, uh, and that was driven by a shift in the mix within our uh, electronic systems portfolio towards more engineered product revenue and, and growth in the profitability uh, as well of those engineered product revenues on a year-over-year -year basis. So that was a significant driver for uh, the uh, electronics segment margins. And uh, we, you know, I would say would expect margins to stay in the ballpark of where you're seeing them here in Q2 yeah. uh, for the rest of the year, right? There is always a range of, I would say, 50 to 75 basis points within which they may fluctuate based on product mix in a particular quarter, but they're in that ballpark. On the structure side, you saw margins this quarter get back to historical levels. We had an unusual situation with Monrovia, which had unusually low revenue and other one-time costs as we were shutting down the facility in Q1, which subdued the overall structure segment margins. That got back to normal here in Q2, helped the structures business improve. We also had some better mix in there, uh, which helped in, in Q2 get the structures margins up. Now, uh, with Monrovia costs being further cut down in Q3, and as Steve mentioned, there, we have less than 20 people now in that facility, uh, we do believe that uh, we will have similar levels of structures margins for, for the second half. And, you know, of course, margins will continue to improve uh, in 2025 as, as the restructuring savings start to kick in uh, and other initiatives take hold. So. Uh, Long-term trajectory margins improve. Second half, I would say margins uh, are expected to stay in the same ballpark. Uh, Q2 margins, I would say, probably have about 75 basis points of favorable mix in them, just overall at the DCO level. Um, and uh, but that's that's typical for us, and and uh, we expect to stay in that range. Yeah, we're gonna hold serve for the most part. 
Okay. Super helpful. Last one I had was um, just your defense revenue, um, you know, had had a bit of a, I guess, transition with um, F-18 and, and the timing of missile, I think, was how you described it. And um, it's, it looks like maybe you've now lapped the former and then have had some orders on the latter. Um, sh should we expect your defense revenues to kind of be stable going forward here, or can the growth rate accelerate? We probably flattish here in the rest of uh, 2024 as we continue to face uh, tough compares on the uh, F-18 uh, in particular, uh, as well as the tow missile program. Uh, but you know, with tow coming back in 2025, as well as other programs such as the Spy 6 ramping up in 2025, we should have better times in defense in, in starting next year. Yeah, we'll be better next year. For sure. Okay. Super helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Noah. Thanks for calling in. Thank you. Thank you. And there appears to be no further questions. I will turn the call back to Stephen Oswald for closing remarks. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, just wanted to uh, thank everyone for joining us. Obviously, we're we're very enthusiastic about our numbers, about our performance uh, as we close uh, uh, the second quarter. We, you know, we feel feel great about where we are and uh, we look forward to continuing to build a, uh, a performance story uh, as we move to our Vision 2027 uh, financial goals. So again, we appreciate all the support and uh, wish you a good day. Thank you. And thank you all for participating in today's conference. You may now disconnect.